Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. New Year, more layoffs. Could that be the story of 2024? Well, the start isn't good. Amazon is firing hundreds of people in their streaming department. Google, too, is laying off employees. These are two of the biggest companies on the planet. So why are they cutting jobs? Is business really that bad? Or is big tech trimming down for more profits? We'll discuss that. Also, what did Maldivian President Mohamed Muizu achieve in China? Is he another Rajapaksa in the making? In the Red Sea, the Houthi rampage continues. Even the United Nations Security Council is now worried. We'll tell you why some countries are more worried than others. Meanwhile, Pakistan is upgrading its fighter jets. Is it time for India to do the same? Can Nikki Haley beat Donald Trump to become the Republican presidential candidate? And Bollywood superstar Shah Rukh Khan is CNN News 18's Indian of the Year. We'll bring you the story of his stunning comeback. All this and more lined up. The headlines first. China calls Taiwan's poll frontrunner a severe danger. Just days ahead of elections, Vice President Lai Qingde has promised to defend Taiwan's independence. Beijing claims the self-ruled island is part of its territory. China has also accused the U.S. of trying to interfere in the elections. At least 15 people killed in riots in Papua New Guinea. Angry crowds torched buildings and ransacked shops. The Prime Minister declares a state of emergency in the capital. The unrest comes amid a strike by the police over pay. The International Court of Justice hears South Africa's genocide case against Israel. The lawsuit accuses Israel of committing genocide in Gaza. But this is not a criminal trial. The United Nations Court will only deliver an opinion on the allegation. In Sweden, two top defence officials asked the citizens to prepare for war. The opposition accuses the defence minister and the military chief of alarmism. Sweden, which is close to joining NATO, has not fought a war in two centuries. And the UK's Labour Party embraces nanny state tactics. Keir Starmer announces his plan for children under a Labour labor government. There will, will be supervised toothbrushing in schools now and no junk food ads before 9pm. Elections in the UK could be held later this year. The season of layoffs continues. The job market remains gripped by a hiring winter and big tech is making it worse. They're cutting more jobs and instituting a hiring freeze. Amazon and Google have announced more layoffs. When you go through their statements explaining the layoffs, you see a pattern emerging. The language is similar, more or less the same words. We are optimizing operations. We are cutting back on expenses. We are reassessing our investments. The same story everywhere. Let's start with Amazon. It's laying off hundreds of employees. Now, Amazon is a massive company, well known for e-commerce, but it has many other business interests apart from e-commerce, like streaming, advertising, cloud computing. As far as we know, this round of layoffs does not affect e-commerce, the core business of the company. Three other verticals will be affected though. Twitch, the streaming unit, Prime Video, which is Amazon's video app, and MGM Studios. MGM stands for Metro Goldwyn Mayer, a famous name in filmmaking. The studio behind film franchisees like Rocky and James Bond. Amazon acquired MGM in 2021. And just over two years later, it is laying off employees. How many? We don't have a number, but reports say hundreds have been laid off. The last two years have been turbulent for Amazon. The layoffs began in 2022. They were extended through 2023 and will continue in 2024. So far, Amazon has sacked. Listen to this. More than 27,000 employees. You heard that right. 27,000 employees laid off. So almost every business vertical has seen layoffs in the company. Same story at Google. Yesterday, it sacked more employees from multiple teams, like Google's voice assistant unit, the hardware team. It makes the Pixel products and Fitbits, the augmented reality team, and Google's central engineering team. Again, hundreds of employees are affected. And why are they doing it? To cut costs. In 2023, Google sacked 12,000 people. That was 6% of its workforce. The largest ever layoff at Google, 12,000 people. Obviously, the employees are not happy. There is an employees union in the company. 
the Alphabet Workers Union. Alphabet, as you would know, is the parent company of Google. This union represents more than 1,400 workers. It says these layoffs were not required. In fact, the union has issued a statement. I have a copy. Listen to this. Our members and teammates work hard every day to build great products for our users, and the company cannot continue to fire our co-workers while making billions every quarter. Will this end Google's layoff drive? Highly unlikely. Sundar Pichai is driving big changes at the company. In 2022, Google's focus changed. Pichai wants a setup that is more agile and cost effective. He wants to pivot towards artificial intelligence. And frankly, he's late. Google has fallen behind in the AI race. OpenAI and Microsoft have challenged the search giant. Google is just playing catch up. It's been forced to change its approach, reduce expenses, speed up the shift to AI. So what's the big takeaway? If you work in the tech sector, this will be a challenging year for you. The layoffs will continue. There will be fewer jobs, more market disruptions. But this is for the employees. For the companies, the prospects look good. Big tech is still raking in billions. In October 2023, Amazon reported its results for the third quarter. The company's profits tripled. Amazon earned more than $140 billion in revenue. What about Google's parent Alphabet? The results were a mixed bag, but profits grew. They jumped by over 40% which makes you wonder, if they're making so much money, why are they firing people? Well, because that's how companies work. They're more loyal to shareholders than staff, always looking to maximize profits. The layoff story is not about big tech struggling, perhaps. It's about big companies looking to improve their bottom line. Let's turn to China now. They're hosting Maldivian President Mohamed Muizu. He's on a five-day visit. Yesterday was his big day in Beijing. First up was a visit to the Communist Party Museum. Muizu looked thoroughly floored. He got a video tour of Chinese history, tried his hand at a simulator, and finally signed the visitor's log. Next up was the main event, his date with Xi Jinping. Muizu and the First Lady got a ceremonial welcome at the Great Hall of People. He inspected a guard of honor. He got a 21-gun salute and then got down to business. I'm undertaking this visit to your beautiful country with seven ministers of my cabinet to as a clear demonstration of my strong commitment and desire to reinvigorate the Maldives long-standing friendship with the government and people of China and to discuss ways of expanding it for the benefit of our people of our two countries. Now this is a classic Chinese strategy. Give your guest a tour, show off your impressive infrastructure, then hold bilateral talks. The idea is quite simple. By the time you get down to business, you're overawed. You're already impressed by China's might. Then it's Xi Jinping's turn to put the finishing touches. Listen to this. You are the first foreign head of state that I've received this year. This visit to China is also your first state visit to a foreign country after taking office as president. Under the new situation, the relations between China and the Maldives are facing a historical opportunity to build on what has been achieved and chart the way forward. She thinks it's a historical opportunity. For him, yes it is. But for the Maldives, not really. This is a country already sinking under Chinese debt. Mali owes China more than $1.3 billion. That's 20% of its total debt. So logically, what should Muizu do? Stay away from Chinese loans and investments. That's what the World Bank told them last year. But Muizu is doing the opposite. He has signed 20 agreements with China. They cover a number of sectors and industries like tourism, disaster management, blue economy, and digital economy. Of course, infrastructure is on the table too. Muizu and Xi agreed to accelerate a number of projects under the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. They also elevated the ties to a new level, that of comprehensive strategic cooperative partnership. I guess the question is why? China has a history of debt traps. You already owe them 20% of your debt. So why go back for seconds? To understand that, we need to, to look at President Muizu. In 2012, he became the Maldives' housing and infrastructure minister, and he held that position until 2018. In that time, China invested a lot of money in the Maldives. Look at some of the major projects. 1,500 housing units 
in Hulhu Mali. Total cost? Around $138 million. In 2015, China won the contract to upgrade an airport. The Vilana International Airport cost $373 million. In 2016, another project was awarded to build a bridge between three Maldivian islands. Again, cost $63 million. It was first called the China Maldives Friendship Bridge. Later, it was renamed to Sina Male Bridge. So that's three major projects in five years. And who was the infrastructure minister during this time? Mohammed Muizu. So clearly he has dealt with Beijing in the past and chances are those contacts remain. Just look at the state visit. Muizu had a meeting with Chang Yong Chun. He is president of BUCG International. That's the Beijing Urban Construction Group, BUCG. They've built some iconic structures in the Chinese capital, like the 2008 Olympic venues. But guess what else they have built? A seaplane terminal at the Valana Airport in the Maldives. And when was the project given? When Muizu was infrastructure minister, he's kept those contacts alive. In 2022, Muizu addressed some Communist Party officials at an online event. Look at what he told them. Our party's return would script a further chapter of strong ties between our two countries. So the love for China is not new. It's been a part of Mohammed Muizu's career. But to bring China in, he had to push India out. So he made New Delhi the enemy. How? With blatant misinformation. And we are not the ones saying this. We are quoting what European election observers have said. They had visited the Maldives during the election. They spent around 11 weeks there in the Maldives. And now they have submitted a report to the European Union. Look at what this report says. I'm quoting. The campaign included anti-Indian sentiments based on fears of Indian influences and anxiety regarding a presence of Indian military personnel inside the country. This theme was subject to multiple online disinformation attempts. In simpler words, fake news. Moizu drummed up fears of Indian influence in the Maldives. He radicalized his supporters and now he's causing up to Beijing, which raises multiple questions about the president. Is he China's man in Mali? Did he get help from China during the elections? And he wouldn't be the first. Reports say China also funded Mahinda Rajapaksa's election campaign in Sri Lanka. Beijing gave his aides $7.6 million plus investments and projects in his hometown. So Beijing has a history of doing this. They also have a history of cutting and running. Muizu should be mindful of that. If not, he could be the next victim. On to the Red Sea now, or should I say the Houthi backwaters. It's been the surprise package of Israel's war. Iran is not doing anything. Hezbollah is not retaliating. But Yemen's Houthis are doing a lot. These are ragtag militants fighting a civil war. How are they holding global trade hostage? Because the world is divided. Most countries agree that the attack should stop, but they won't say it out loud. Case in point, the United Nations Security Council. On Wednesday, the council passed a new resolution. It demanded an immediate end to the Houthi attacks. Eleven members backed the resolution. The remaining four abstained. That's Russia, China, Algeria and Mozambique. Listen to their justification. I would like to once again underscore that this resolution cannot be seen as legitimizing the actions in the Red Sea of the so-called coalition made up of the U.S. and its allies. The draft resolution remains ambiguous on several key issues, which makes us worry that it might not be able to achieve the intended effect or even lead to negative consequences. Do you see the problem here? They won't send warships, they won't condemn the Houthis, they won't back a resolution, but they won't veto it either. What does that tell you? No one wants to be the bad cop against the Houthis. They fear it will be seen as anti-Palestine. Why? Because the Houthis claim to be fighting for Palestine. It's not just Russia and China. Arab countries are also guilty here, especially Jordan and Egypt. Egypt earns around $9 billion annually from the Suez Canal. It's a mainstay of their economy. If ships don't use the Red Sea, Egypt will lose that money. Same with Jordan. The Red Sea is vital for their trade. 
It carries 33% of their imports and 54% of their exports, yet both these countries are silent. They would much rather suffer, suffer losses than speak out. So the Houthis simply carry on. Even the military muscle has not scared them. Just look at all the deployments. India leads the list. The Navy has deployed 10 warships in the region. That's the Red Sea plus the Arabian Sea. The US has deployed three. The UK has deployed three. Sri Lanka is planning to send one. France, Italy and Spain have one each and Pakistan has two or three. That's all the deployments we know of. Put together, around 23 warships. We're talking about advanced lethal war machines. 23 of them, but the Houthis don't care. On Tuesday, they took things up a notch. Some 21 drones were fired at vessels in the Red Sea. It was the largest Houthi attack yet. Thankfully, none of them hit their target. They were shot down by US and UK warships. But you can't shoot down every drone. Neither can you escort every ship. So what more can these countries do? Well, some experts say hit back. Don't just defend ships, go on the offensive. Both the U.S. and the U.K. have now hinted at that. We've warned them. Uh, we put ships in the Red Sea. They've got a choice to make, and uh, the right choice is to stop these attacks. And as I said again, I'll say it three times now, they'll bear the consequences for failure to do so. So uh, we call on Tehran, but also directly on the Houthis. This absolutely must stop. There will be consequences if it doesn't. Uh, and, uh, and they have, I'm afraid, failed to heed the warnings issued on the 3rd of January. Bear the consequences. That's the message from the US and the UK. But threats alone may not work. Minor reprisals won't deter the Houthis. We've already seen that. Last month, the US sank three Houthi boats. They also killed 10 of their fighters. But days later, the Houthis were back. So small responses will not work. And for big responses, there is no appetite. If you launch a major attack on the Houthis, it could trigger a wider war. The likes of Hezbollah or Iran may join in. So what's the solution? Maybe good old diplomacy. Iran has close ties with the Houthi rebels. Most of their weapons come from Iran, including some of the drones that they're firing into the Red Sea. So why not pressure Tehran to rein them in? It's the logical solution. But for that, we need to be on the same page. You can't be half-hearted like China, Russia and the Arab world. You must admit it's a global problem. Some 12% of global trade passes via the Red Sea. It is not a regional issue. It's very much a global one. Closer to home, there is another security nightmare. China is starting an arms race. It is ready to supply new fighter jets to Pakistan. We're talking about fifth generation stealth warplanes. Now, what is a fifth generation aircraft? It's the most powerful plane known to humankind. What makes an aircraft fifth generation? It must have some new and modern features, like the ability to avoid detection and fly at supersonic speeds, among other things. China is developing a fifth-generation fighter. It is called the J-31GYR Falcon. Pakistan wants it too. It wants to replace its American F-16 fleet. The plane's biggest USP is its stealth capability. Apparently, the plane can disappear. It can escape radar detection. But why is this a problem for India? Because India does not have a stealth fighter. So in theory, if Pakistan gets this Chinese plane first, it will have aerial superiority. Pakistan's military says it will acquire the plane soon. The Air Force chief made the announcement this month. He said, and I'm quoting here, the foundation for acquiring the J-31 stealth fighter aircraft has already been laid, which is all set to become part of the fleet in the near future. Well, when will that happen? Pakistan has not shared a time frame. How many jets do they plan to buy? Again, they won't say. Also, how will Pakistan buy a plane? Where is the money? Too many questions, but the fact is the J-31 is still in development. Even the Chinese Air Force doesn't have it. So basically, all Pakistan has is a promise. The plane may come at some point. There are a lot of ifs and buts, and there is no money, clearly. And so far, the world knows little about the J-31 or its true capabilities. A few years back, some photographs had emerged. The plane looks a lot like the American F-35. There is speculation that it's a copy, that China stole the blueprints of the F-35 and used them to build the J-31. Classic China. This plane could be a clone of the, of the F-35. 
Now, reports say China is building it for its new aircraft carrier, the Fujian. Will it build a land-based version too? So far, the Chinese military has not shown interest. But long story short, Pakistan will have to be patient. The balance of power is not shifting anytime soon. Having said that, India cannot afford to be complacent. China is now Pakistan's biggest defense partner and the main supplier of arms. Pakistan is already using Chinese jets. It is involved in co-development projects, also manufacturing. So China will continue to arm Pakistan with the newest and most advanced weapons it can spare. And India has ground to cover. The Indian Air Force needs some crucial upgrades. It has a sanction strength of 42 squadrons. But how many are active today? Just 32. 32 squadrons, that's 10 short of the target. One squadron has 18 aircraft. So India needs about 180 new planes. And there's another problem. Many of the existing aircraft are old, the likes of Jaguar and the Mirage 2000s. They need to be phased out by the end of this decade. So a complete overhaul is needed. New Delhi has taken some steps to address this. In 2021 and 2023, India placed orders for new Tejas jets. How many planes is New Delhi buying? Around 180 in all. The deliveries begin this year. In addition to this, India plans to acquire more than 100 other jets. What kind of planes are these? Multi-role fighter aircraft, something like the Rafale fighter. India has acquired 36 Rafale jets from France, but it needs more such planes, and so far the progress has been, has been sluggish. The Air Force requested these planes more than a decade ago. The red tape has slowed down acquisition. New Delhi needs to accelerate that, not just because of Pakistan, but also because of China, because all said and done, China poses a bigger military challenge to India. It's critical that we meet and match China's fleet and capabilities. Now let's turn our attention to Africa. Trouble is brewing in Somalia. The terrorist group Al-Shabaab has kidnapped at least five foreign nationals, people who are working as contractors for the United Nations. The team was in a helicopter. They were carrying medical supplies, but the helicopter malfunctioned. It had to make an emergency landing in central Somalia in an area controlled by Al-Shabaab. The terrorist group then seized the aircraft and they've reportedly killed one person from the team. They've captured some of the others. The United Nations has confirmed the capture, but they're withholding further information like the identities of the foreign nationals. Our next report tells you everything we know so far. A helicopter carrying United Nations contractors went down in Somalia. There were at least eight people in the chopper at least two local crew members and some foreign nationals. The helicopter was on a mission for the UN. It was headed to Whistletown in central Somalia, near the front lines, where Somalian forces are fighting the terrorist group Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab is a terror group that is affiliated with Al-Qaeda. It has around 10,000 fighters, with strongholds in parts of central and southern Somalia. Al-Shabaab has been waging a war of terror for years now, on Somalia and neighboring nations. The Somali government and an African Union peacekeeping force are fighting the group. And these counter-terrorist forces get help from the UN. The UN helicopter that was seized was on one such support mission. It was carrying medical supplies and it was supposed to airlift injured soldiers out of the war zone. But it never made it to the extraction point. The helicopter malfunctioned en route and it had to make an emergency landing right in Al-Shabaab territory. The terrorists were quick to react. They seized the helicopter and captured some of the people on board. At least one person was killed. I can confirm that there was an incident involving a uh, UN contracted helicopter that took place today in uh, Galmudug in Somalia. Uh, response efforts are underway, uh, but I, I think if you will understand for the sake of the safety of all those on board, we're not going to say anything more at this point. The UN doesn't want to give details at this point. We don't know who the foreign nationals are, their countries of origin, or how many of them were captured. The UN says response efforts are underway. Somalia's information minister has said his government is undertaking efforts to rescue the crew. But reports say no Somali troops have been dispatched. The area where the helicopter went down is one of Al-Shabaab's strongholds. The terror group has controlled it for over a decade. 
so it's unlikely that they will be dislodged anytime soon, at least not without help. A Somali soldier based near the area gave a bleak assessment. He said, I do not know if there will be commandos on planes with the help of foreigners. That may be the only possible way to rescue them, but so far it has not happened. Foreign governments may not want to send in their troops, so the only option seems to be diplomacy. That's what the UN seems to be banking on anyway. Let's hope their plan works and the hostages are released soon. It's election year in America. By many estimates, it will likely be a 2020 rematch. Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. The Republican pool has seen a lot of contenders. Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, even Mike Pence. But none of them could stand up against Donald Trump. The former U.S. president remains a clear favorite among his party and the people. He is leading in most states. He is leading in most polls. But something strange is happening in New Hampshire. Trump had a sizable lead here. But that's been reduced to single digits. And who is giving him competition? It's Nikki Haley. In New Hampshire, Trump is polling at 39%. Haley is at 32%. So she is a wild card candidate who's definitely having a moment. And when I become president, we will end this national self-loathing that's taken over our country where people say America's bad or America's rotten or America's racist. We will go back to where we say we love America. But will she become president? Can Nikki Haley stand up against Donald Trump? Can she win the White House? Let's start with her background. Nikki Haley was born in South Carolina to Indian immigrants. Her full name is Nimrat Nikki Randhava. So Nikki is her middle name, and that's what she goes by. At 31 years of age, Nikki Haley turned to politics. She ran for state legislature. She won against a Republican incumbent. And since then, she's only risen up the ranks. She served as the governor of South Carolina. She was on the Trump cabinet. As the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley was, in fact, the first Indian American to be on a presidential cabinet. So it's been an impressive career. Anyway, But is it impressive enough to take on Donald Trump? because he's leading national polls by 50 points. It's a massive lead. Usually, any candidate with a lead like that is unlikely to lose. And yet, this is Trump. He has legal challenges. And then there are other challenges, like New Hampshire. The New Hampshire primary is, is on the 23rd of January. That's where Republicans will choose who they want as their presidential candidate. If Nikki Haley wins here, and it's a long shot still, it could change the race. It would show that Trump is not unbeatable. It would give Nikki Haley's campaign new momentum because to beat Trump, Haley needs three M's, money, media focus, and momentum. She has the first two. Now she needs to build momentum. And Donald Trump realizes that because in the last two weeks, he has taken a lot of digs at Nikki Haley in particular. His campaign has been targeting her. He's talking about her in rallies. He's questioned the citizenship much. status wow. of her parents. So the attacks are on, and it's likely because Trump feels threatened. Nikki Haley has been in the pocket of the open borders establishment owners her entire career, and uh, she's a globalist, you know. She likes the globe. I like America first. The people in this room like America first. But for a moment, imagine this. Nikki Haley gets the momentum. Trump's, Trump drops out. She becomes the Republican candidate. What happens then? Can she also win the White House? Can she become the first female U.S. president? When Trump entered the political scene, he made a lot of noise. He was anti-immigration. He was pro-tweeting. Trump was an anomaly. Nikki Haley is more establishment. She is a through-and-through -through Republican. She's a conservative. And she's pro-business. She China's wants to cut taxes. She wants to reduce government spending. She's a foreign policy hawk. She wants to stay in NATO and support Ukraine. So basically, everything that Trump does not want, which may appeal to many Republicans. But what makes her even more appealing is that Nikki Haley is more moderate than most Republicans. Look at her views on abortion. Most Republicans want an abortion ban in the U.S., but Nikki Haley has called for consensus. She's acknowledged the complexity of this issue. It is the right thing that unelected justices no longer decide this, and it's in the hands of the people. I appreciate that Texas went more on the pro-life side. But as we go through this, listen, my heart broke for her because I had trouble having my children. These, the states are now going to have to look at these because what we don't want to see 
is a woman with a rare condition having to carry a baby until term. This makes her a middle ground candidate. She's practical, she doesn't do anything out of the blue, and she's not in her 70s. So for many swing voters who like neither Biden nor Trump, she could be the go-to candidate. And that can help her take some lead in this race. But again, will it be enough to take down Donald Trump? We'll find out on January 23rd. If Nikki Haley does win New Hampshire, it could change the Republican presidential race. Now let's talk about Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, social media mogul, and the sixth richest person in the world. The tech billionaire has a new passion project. He plans to enter the field of agriculture, but not in the standard way, no. Zuckerberg plans to, and I'm quoting, create some of the highest quality beef in the world. How? By raising cows on macadamia nuts and home-brewed beer at his nuclear bunker-equipped complex in Hawaii. If that sounds absurd and hedonistic to you, you're not alone. Zuckerberg is being slammed for his bullheaded scheme. Here's our report. Mark Zuckerberg, genius, billionaire, cowboy, agriculturalist. The Facebook founder seems to want that as his new identity because he's moving away from the high-tech world of social media and entering the high-stakes business of animal husbandry with high-quality beefsteaks, apparently. Zuckerberg put up a few pictures on Instagram yesterday. The first shows him beaming at a giant cut of meat. The caption says he has started raising cattle. Not just any old cattle, but Wagyu and Angus. This in itself would have been a luxurious enterprise. Those two cow breeds are among the most expensive and sought after in the world. But that isn't enough for Zuckerberg. He wants to turbocharge the luxury. He plans to raise the cattle on macadamia meal and beer. You may be familiar with macadamia nuts. They're the super expensive kind. Zuckerberg is planning to feed them to his cows and have them wash that down with beer. Craft beer brewed at his private ranch in Hawaii. Yes, did we mention the opulent cows will be raised for the slaughter on a paradise island? The entire venture sounds surreal, like a bored billionaire's midlife crisis. And that would be totally fine if it didn't affect the rest of us, not in the era of rampant climate change. Zuckerberg has come under fire after he shared his post. Climate activists are up in arms because cattle rearing is quite harmful for the environment. Cows are known to release methane. Studies show that a fully grown cow can release 500 litres of methane a day. They account for about 3.7% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, just cow burps. Now imagine a herd of cows belching after they down some artisanal beer. That can't be good for climate change. Cows also produce a lot of waste, and cattle rearing is linked to water pollution because of this. Surely, native Hawaiians don't want their beautiful waters tainted with cow waste, especially from cows raised on macadamia nuts and beer. And speaking of macadamia nuts, that's another waste, of land this time. Zuckerberg even mentions in his post that each cow eats 5,000 to 10,000 pounds of food each year, so that's a lot of acres of macadamia trees. Yes, that is. The University of Hawaii says that the yield from one acre of macadamia trees is between 5,200 to 7,000 pounds. So Zuckerberg will be using giant tracts of land to feed his cows macadamia nuts. Talk about extravagance and a detachment from reality. Around the world, food prices are going up. People are having to cut back on essentials. Some don't know where their next meal is coming from. And here we have a billionaire who wants to raise luxury beef. Zuckerberg seems to have gone from a tech geek to a modern-day Mary Antoinette. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. So easy to say, but so hard to actually do, which is why comebacks are special. Before we go further, I have some headlines for you. They're from the last decade, all of them, and this is what they say. Shah Rukh Khan's career is now officially over. Is King Khan's reign nearing its end? Is Shah Rukh Khan losing the Battle of Khans? End of an era, SRK movies losing their charm. 
Now we cut to 2024. Turns out Shah Rukh Khan's reign is not over. He's made a comeback for the ages. Three massive hits. Some 2,500 crores at the box office and to underline it, a very special award. Shah Rukh Khan is CNN News 18's Indian of the Year. He was honoured in New Delhi yesterday. His acceptance speech was classic Shah Rukh Khan. I've kept my speech written because it is checked three, four times over that I don't say something stupid and wrong and I get <coughs> picked on for it. But still, I'd like to say this thing, which is very, very brash, that I don't just feel like the Indian of the Year. I feel I have been the Indian of all the years gone by. And I will be the Indian for all the years to come. I am actually, ladies and gentlemen, the Indian for all ages. Indian for all ages, that's what he called himself, and very few would dispute that. Shah Rukh Khan made his Bollywood debut in 1992. It's been more than 30 years. Now, staying relevant for three decades is a big deal. Staying on top of your game is a whole different matter. That's what Shah Rukh Khan has done. His fans cut across ages, genders, religions, and regions. In other words, Indian for all ages. Enough has been said about his art. We know how good he is as an actor. His awards and box office numbers attest to that. But let's look beyond that, beyond the actor you see on the screen. It's been a tough four or five years for Shah Rukh Khan, both personally and professionally. His last movie before 2023 was Zero. It released back in 2018 and soon criticism poured in, the sort of stuff we showed you at the start. People wrote off his career. They said SRK has lost his charm. Then came 2021. Shah Rukh Khan's son was arrested in a drug case. He spent close to 30 days in jail. And it wasn't just the arrest. It was the way some people reacted and commented on it. His son was just 24 years old. No court had found him guilty, and the questions would not stop. Questions on Shah Rukh Khan's parenting, on his family life, on his son's personal life, things that had no relevance in courts. Despite that, he never spoke out. No emotional outbursts, no angry responses. He kept chugging on. Shah Rukh Khan did not address that saga directly. But he did speak about personal troubles at the News 18 Awards. Listen to how he overcame them. At a personal level, a little bit of bothersome and unpleasant things also happened, to say the least, which <coughs> made me learn a lesson. That be quiet, be very quiet, and work hard with dignity, and still not any heart. When you think that everything is good, suddenly out of nowhere, wham, life may come and hit you, and topple your apple cart. But this is the time where you need to be the hopeful, happy, honest storyteller, and continue doing whatever you're doing. And that's the lesson here. Quiet perseverance. Have confidence in your skills, surround yourself with good people, work hard, and be honest and true to yourself. It's the universal key to success. It's a key that Shah Rukh Khan has. He never complained during those tough times. He let his art do the talking, whether it's sending a political message or speaking about injustices or promoting harmony. You can find all these themes in his latest movies, his characters may have been mouthing the words, but to his fans, it was Shah Rukh Khan speaking. And then yesterday, he took the mic. He hasn't spoken to mainstream Indian media in a long, okay, long so time, I, I but he did speak time. at the CNN yeah, News 18 event, at all. even took some questions in the end. He talked about being scared you before Pathan's end. release. <laughs> he called movie analysts also, so. idiots. And he joked about not receiving an award for a long time. Like I said, it was classic Shah Rukh Khan, humor, ease, and charm. That this award should be devoured by me. It should only be eaten by me. Because in the voice of Vikram Rathor from Javan, I am hungry. So in conclusion, let me ask this controversial question. Will there be another SRK in India? I won't predict the future, I can't, but I will say this. Shah Rukh Khan will be working 24-7 to make sure there isn't, not by punching down on others, but by quietly working to be better. 
For our next story, let me ask you this. Have you seen Batman? Do you remember Gotham City, where everything descends into chaos? That was the scene in New York yesterday. It started with a secret tunnel. It was built under a historic synagogue in Brooklyn. When the police came to inspect it, young men blocked them and tried to fill it up. That led to a brawl. Nine of them have been arrested. But it's still unclear who built it. How was this tunnel built and why was it built, especially since it is under a busy Brooklyn street? Our next report tells you all you need to know about New York's secret tunnel. 770 Eastern Parkway in New York, Brooklyn's Crown Heights neighborhood. It's the world headquarters for the Chabad Lubavitch movement. It's one of the world's best known Hasidic movements. Also, one of the largest Jewish religious organizations. So why is it in the news now? It's because of a secret tunnel built under the headquarters of this historic synagogue. And it's led to a lot of chaos. There was a hunt for the end of the tunnel police on the streets, the mayor calling for immediate action, a brawl, arrests and much more. If someone did not know that it was New York, they would think they've landed up in Gotham because only Batman could have made sense of what was happening. The story begins with a group of worshippers, a small faction. Apparently, they wanted to expand the synagogue, so they started digging. Of course, it wasn't legal, so they kept it a secret. They went from the basement to under the synagogue to an empty space nearby. When the leaders found out, they sent a cement truck to fill up the tunnel. And that's when all hell broke loose. When they did that, the Hasidic students who supported the tunnel staged an impromptu protest, getting inside the passage and refusing to leave. Soon the police arrived. The worshippers blocked them too. That led to a brawl. Benches were broken. The prayer space was damaged. Nine people were arrested. They were charged with criminal mischief, reckless endangerment and obstructing governmental administration. Currently, the building remains closed. That's because the tunnel is being inspected. The city is trying to figure out two things. First, where does the tunnel end? And second, will it impact the foundation of the property? After all, the synagogue is one of the city's famous sites. Thousands visit it every year. New York City cannot have it collapse. Plus, the city has to figure out what to do with the tunnel. It's located under a busy Brooklyn street. The obvious solution is to close it, to fill it with cement. New York hasn't taken any decision yet. They are still inspecting the secret tunnel. No one knows what the future of the tunnel will look like. But if it's not taken care of, it could end up becoming another haven for rats. And New York surely wouldn't want that. Do you feel tired all the time? No matter how much sleep you get or caffeine you consume, despite that, do you also have trouble sleeping? Are you constantly hungry but also nauseous? Spend every second working but do not get enough done. Well, I'm not personally attacking you because I'm not the one asking all of this. A tweet is, it went viral a few years ago and thousands of people could relate to it. But it's not the only one. Posts after posts confirm that people are zonked. And they have tried to fix the fatigue by getting more sleep, probably why sleep tracking has become an international pastime, an obsession perhaps. Despite the eye shut, our bodies seem to have shut down. That's because sleep and rest are not the same thing. And I'll show it to you. Take a look at this list. On the left are countries that get the most sleep. On the right are nations that are the most fatigued. Notice that New Zealand is on both the lists. It is the sleepiest nation. An average Kiwi gets more than seven and a half hours of sleep per night, yet the nation is among the most tired. Same goes for Australia and the UK. That's because rest is not about how much you sleep or when. For instance, 45% Indians go to bed before 11 p.m., yet 39% men and 47% women do not feel refreshed in the morning, they say. According to research, you can get all the sleep you want and still be exhausted. Here's why. Sleep is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Being tired is a lot like getting hurt. You have to know what hurts and when. 
Fatigue is not the same for everyone, but scientists have tried to define it. They say there are five major ways of being tired. So five different type of rests that you need. The first is obvious, physical fatigue. If you're tired from exercising, sleep can help. But you can sit in an office chair all day and still be tired. In that case, ironically, exercise could be restful. The next type is mental fatigue, like feeling befuddled or nervy, forgetting what you were doing or misplacing things. In this case, low yield activities will help, like creating art or listening to music. So your brain can space out and rest. The third type is emotional fatigue, when too many thoughts cloud your mind. In this case, confronting your feelings helps. Next is social fatigue, when human interaction becomes draining. For some, spending alone time is restful, but social rest does not mean you opt out of socializing. So for others, quality time with friends can charge their batteries. Sensory overload can be exhausting too. If a co-worker's loud ringtone bothers you or you hate your partner for chewing loudly, it means that your noise sensitivity is heightened. So before you go on a shooting spree, just take a moment of silence. Listen to some natural sounds or soothing music because rest comes in many avatars. Yet, it seems to be elusive. We live in a culture of immediate responsiveness. We don't like standing in lines or waiting for websites to load. We stare at screens all day, sometimes multiple screens at the same time. Netflix and chill is rarely all that chill. So we are high achieving, but also chronically tired. We suffer from a rest deficit because we don't understand the power of rest. Rest is vital for physical and mental health. It allows our bodies time to recover. It boosts our immune system, prevents injuries. It increases concentration and memory, reduces stress, and improves mood. Rest is the best thing that can happen to you. It may be an uncomfortable concept for some and a difficult one for others. But think of rest as basic maintenance. Humans have become caffeine-fueled zombies functioning with frayed nerves. We can't keep existing on two brain cell energy. Sure, we can rest when we are dead, but must we wait that long? And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Moscow, a severe winter storm blankets the Russian capital in snow. In Africa, the Congo River Basin is witnessing a once-in-a-generation flood with over 300 people killed. And our huge TVs, and I saw for you, Get this world's first folding TV for $200,000. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1922. Insulin was used to treat a diabetic patient for the first time. The patient was a 14-year-old boy. He had type 1 diabetes. Within 24 hours, his dangerously high blood sugar levels dropped. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Sure. Let's get down. I'm going to take a little bit of 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 a little bit